Greenhouse, how you doing? I want to welcome you guys. My name is Mike Patz. I'm one of the pastors around here. It's a joy to welcome you. Some of you that are over at Kanapaha, God bless you and everyone that's in Auditorium A and everyone that's in Auditorium B. What is up? Would you take out a Bible, go to 1 John chapter 3, stand to your feet and say overcome. About to get into a passage that is just flat out um, exciting for me to preach this today. I've got so much faith that God is going to use these verses to do something inside of our hearts. If you agree with that, would you just kind of shake your head like, yeah, let's do this, you know? So 1 John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 4. And I want you to get your souls and hearts ready if you're joining us online somewhere. God bless you. So glad that you guys are here. Missionary Sam is joining us in another part of the world. He just texted me a little bit ago, said uh, he is... uh, in a spot where the only place he can be in church today is here. So why don't we all say what's up to Missionary Sam? Can we make some noise for Missionary Sam right now? Hello, Sam. God bless you. We love you. First John chapter 3, starting in verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Is anyone enjoying this already? Like, This is like right in your face. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Before I even finish reading this, let me just announce to you that the work of Jesus has destroyed the works of the devil. That the work of Jesus has destroyed the works of depression, has destroyed the works of injustice, has destroyed the works of confusion, has destroyed the works of infirmity. Even right now, I pray that any of you that are infirmed in the name of Jesus, even as I speak, that your bodies are touched even now. That your minds are touched even now. In the name of Jesus, he came to destroy the works of the devil, and he did not fail. In fact, he said, it is It is finished. Verse 9, no one born of God, no one born of God, no one born of God keeps on sinning, makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, and here's the theme verse today, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. By this it is evident who are the children of God, who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Today we're going to talk about the paternity test. The paternity test. Let's pray. God help. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So I was over in Spain a few weeks ago, and in Europe people have very small families. Uh, they, they have not been wildly fruitful and multiplied. So obviously when people would ask, when you'd say, how many kids do you have? And they'd say, I have one or I have none or I have two. It was like a big family was two. Um, when they were trying to know how many children we have, of course we have eight children. And so when they found that out, uh, they were like, whoa, you know, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, really? And then the next question, are you the father of all of them? To which my response is, you know, I, I would say, you know, supuestamente, you know, supposedly, my wife tells me that supposedly <laughs> I am, although I have not done a paternity test, was my response. So they'd say, well, let's see the picture. So we give them a picture. So for example, here's the picture. So by the time they looked at my family, they ended up saying, you are the father <laughs> of those children. That's what they would say. You are the father. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the show Maury. Has anyone ever seen the show Maury? But if you've ever watched this show, of course, the, the nature of this show is that there's someone that comes on the show, and there's a child, and the father ends up saying, wait a minute, um, I, I, don't, I don't know that that, you know, like there's a kid that comes out, and you're kind of like, okay, and when the, and the woman cheated or did something or whatever, and she's like, you know, what's going on here? And, and if you've ever watched the show, it kind of comes down to just the eyeball test lets you know 
someone is or isn't the death. What we're dealing with today is in verse 10 when he says, by this it is evident. By this it is evident. This is like the mori of the Bible right here. That By this it is evident who are the children of God, who are the children of the devil. Whoever doesn't practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who doesn't love his brother. In other words, the, the, the paternity test of the kingdom of God goes like this. People that are born of God, number one, they make a practice of righteousness. And number two, they're known for love. Number one, they, they make a practice of righteousness. And number two, they're known for love. He says, it's just evident. There's no point in arguing about this. When someone looked at my family picture and I said, well, you know, she tells me I'm the daddy. When they look at the picture, they say, no, you are the daddy. What he's saying is, obviously there are nuances to this, but he says there's an eyeball test. And when we look at a world right now that, that looks at the church, I, I just want to lay out before you, it's, it's very often that we are prone to sort of go in one side or the other. It's almost like there's a group of practicing righteousness Christians, and then there's this other group of loving Christians, and you've got some people that say, you know, I, listen, I might not be very righteous, and I might not be very holy, and, and I'm kind of wretched, but at least I love people. And then you get other people like, well, I don't love people very well, but at least I'm kind of righteous, and I'm not a wretch like you are. And what he says is, no, the paternity test of God goes like this. Those who belong to God, they make a practice of righteousness. They don't keep on sinning. And they're known for love. I, I, I need you catching the vision here, guys. It's, it's not either righteousness or love. It's righteousness and love. It's, it's not either holiness or kindness. It's holiness and kindness. It's not uh, being right or being merciful. It's that we are right and we, we aspire to be right, but we're also very merciful. It's not an and. It's not, a, it's not an or it's, it's an and where we come and we say, God, and, and I want to drop a word because this keeps coming up in this book, that God's people are to be holy. We are to be holy. And yet our holiness, it's not a cold holiness. It's not a closed holiness. It's an affectionate, warm, inviting holiness so that we become like our Father in heaven, that Jesus, when he came to earth, he was the, he was the friend of sinners, and yet he was the enemy of sin. And guys, I'm calling us to be a friend of sinners and an enemy of sin. I'm calling us to be public enemy number one to sin and public friend number one to sinners. I meet people sometimes that will find out that they'll hear about someone's a Christian or whatever, and they say, you know what, I cannot argue with their, their rationality. I cannot argue with what they're saying, but when I see you, I don't want to be like you. Yes, you're very holy and you're very righteous, but I don't want to be like you. You're just so cold and nauseating. And my friends, that is not the godliness that this describes. What God, God is utterly holy, and yet Jesus is the friend of sinners. And so today, I'm calling the children of God to look like their father. Let me just make it clear. Children of God look like their daddy. People are supposed to look at us and say, we know who's the baby daddy, and his name is God. Number one, they make a practice of righteousness. Verse four, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. Now, this is a difficult passage because if any of you, let's just be real, let's get real frank here. How many of you have sinned this week? Let's just do a little quick uh, eyeball test here. How many of you sinned? Okay, 75% uh, of you have sinned this week, all right? 25% of you are liars, all right? So <laughs> th this passage is difficult because everyone who makes a practice of sin, it's making a practice. Let me get real clear. Everybody sins. But everybody does not make a practice of sinning. There's a big, because I hear people say sometimes, yes, I, man, I, I, know, I know I'm doing this, but Mike, everybody sins. No, no, I, no, you're exactly right. Everybody sins. But there is a difference between slipping into sin and making sin your permanent address. Everybody sins. Everyone doesn't make a practice of sinning. When, when you're in, uh, in sports, like when people in, in sports, they will say, practice makes practice makes perfect or practice can make imperfect if someone's got bad uh, form and they keep on doing that practice will actually make imperfect and someone keeps their imperfect form uh, more to the point if any of you ever studied piano a lot of times piano teachers will say uh, it's not just that practice makes perfect because it's hard to get perfect but practice does make permanent 
Practice makes permanent. So the things that you practice eventually become permanent. If you practice gossiping, you get really good at gossiping. Like, you know how to get right to the edge where it's sort of socially acceptable, where it's like, well, I, I'm just asking you to pray, man. I'm just asking us all to be praying. Man, we need to be praying for sister so-and-so because it, when you make a practice of gossip, you get really good. It becomes permanent. When you make a practice of not the outright lies, but just the little tiny lies, like just the little bits of deception, then that becomes permanent. Verse 5, it says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him... In Jesus, there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. See, point number one in this paternity test, God's people are known. It's not that we are sinless, but we are sinning less as time goes on and on. I need you catching the vision on this. You will not be sinless this side of heaven. You better be sinning less. When people say, well, everyone's just human. No, you're not just human. You're a child of God. Don't tell me you're just human. If someone says, well, I'm I'm just a father. No, you're not just a father. You're also a husband, and you are a friend, and you are a brother. You're not just human. You may be human, but you're not just human if you belong to Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, his blood is inside of you now. His, His nature has been worked inside. The power of his spirit is now accessible and available to you. Someone say amen. It's beautiful how he says this, that, that even though everyone slips on sin, we don't keep on. See, if you know him, when you, see here, this is the point. When you know Jesus, sin isn't just a sterile thing anymore. Yeah, I, I sin. No, listen, man. When, like, I know this woman. This is my wife. When I do her wrong because I know her, I see her face. I see the pain in her eyes. I, I, I feel, like, what he's saying is, when you know him, You can't keep going back to him and just keeping on doing the same thing, knowing that your gossip put him on the cross, knowing that your deception nailed him, knowing that your lust were whips on his back, knowing that your pride was the crown of thorns in his head, knowing that yours, you can't, you won't keep on doing that when you know, now if you don't know him, sin's just a sterile thing, like, well, yeah, I guess I owe a debt to a cosmic ruler and the, the cosmic dictator of the universe. But it's very different when you're trying to avoid the, the eternal cosmic IRS from paying your taxes. That's a lot different than when you actually abide and know someone, look at them in the eyes every time you pray, draw near to them when you get in worship, and then to know that you, if any of you have ever been living in sin and you try to draw near and you could feel it because it wasn't just religion, it was a relationship. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. They don't make a practice of sinning. See, it says in verse 7, let no one, watch, let no one deceive you, little children. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Let no one deceive you. We are saved by grace, not by works. But listen, saving grace doesn't just save you, it changes you. I want, you to give you, I want to give you some great news. The grace of God is not just a ticket out of jail. The grace of God is the power to overcome. Look at someone next to you and say, overcome. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Now, it doesn't get any more clear than this. There are some of you that are sitting in the room right now, some of you that are watching right now, some of you in auditorium May right now, some of you can have a right now, and you are children of God. And there's some others of you that might even think you're a child of God, but that's not your daddy. Your daddy's a little different, much different. This is exactly what it says right here. It says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. How big of a deal is this? It's such a big deal that the paternity, the eyeball test, the paternity test reveals this. The paternity test reveals this. Whoever makes a practice of sinning, it says, sin is lawlessness. I think about over in Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and he will say, depart from me. You workers of lawlessness, I never knew you. It's, it's the, the, an issue, someone says, well, Mike, I thought we're not under the law. No, you're not under the law. When you come to Jesus, his law gets written on your heart. We don't disregard the law. God now comes and he re- writes that law on our heart. Whoever makes the practices of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, no one born of God, wait, let me back up for a second. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Let me make this real clear. When you sin and you keep on sinning, you develop soul ties with the devil. There is a way in which there is a difference between slipping into sin 
and sinning in a way where you just keep on wallowing in the sin. Whoever, when you sin and keep on sinning, it's like you form these soul attachments with the devil. I was reading this week about porn and porn addiction specifically, and one of the problems with porn is that uh, it's not just moral. What usually starts off morally, someone looks at pornography and they shouldn't, they say the problem is it goes from just being moral to becomes cr- like something in the cranium to where it actually becomes an addiction, oxytocin levels, the levels of the, the chemistry that goes on in your brain goes in such a way that even physiologically people get addicted to this the same way someone's physiologically addicted to, to crack cocaine. And so what will happen is someone tries to treat it simply simply morally, but it's not just moral at that point. It's also cranial. It's something going on in the cranium to where if you're not acknowledging that there's something not just spiritual, but something physical going on, if all you do is, it, just like if I were to walk up to someone, they say, I've got a broken arm. I was out drinking. I got drunk. I broke my arm. I'm like, I rebuke the devil. I cast the devil out of you. Well, that's all good and fine, but you still have a broken arm. You still need a cast for the arm. Same thing here, that there is a way in which when you do certain things, you'll develop so There are soul attachments that happen. It's not just moral that God just forgives you from it. It's also where there are attachments that have been created. So that in your brain, for example, with porn, as an example, it's not just that you need to get forgiveness of your sin from a sin that you did three days ago. It's also something's got to get broken in your brain, which might take a little while, just like an arm takes a couple months to heal. Your brain takes some time to get over it. No one born of God Verse 9 makes a practice of sinning. Look at this. This is wild to me. It says, he cannot keep on sinning. He cannot. You ever said that? I just can't. I just can't. Like, like I was in Pakistan. They had fields of broccoli or cauliflower. I don't know if anyone here, I hate cauliflower. To me, that is the picture of hell. Like, if you ask me what hell looks like, hell is the smell. Hell is the smell of cauliflower to me. I'm like, cauliflower soup? Like when someone, I'm like, oh, you know, just the gag reflex, you know? I'm not, like, this is the, like if you said to me, I've got some cauliflower soup, I'd say, I, I can't. I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't. Like that's what I, I just can't. Like that, like, li- like literally there's a, uh, the, it, it's, it, it's, it's like a reflex. This is what he's saying about sin. Whoever's born of God, he just can't. The way, you, you know, Pastor Lastinger would always say, Christians can sin, but they can't sin comfortably. Eventually, sin, sin, sin. Don't be cold or hot. If you're lukewarm, the Bible says he will spew out of his mouth. What is that? It's like that. This is how it is. It's, it's, do any of you have gag reflexes? You ever, see, you ever had a big pill? You ever tried to take a big pill? You know, like, you're like, man, I got to... Like someone says, go take my kids, it's hard. Like, can we crush something up? If you've ever had to swallow like a horse-sized pill, like Murray, what Murray does, there, this is what he says about sin. <laughs> Not that he does that. Murray was a vet that would give horse. <laughs> Murray, Murray. Murray's tough, man. Murray's just tough. I, in other words, I just can't. I can't. I, I can slip into sin. What he's saying is children of God They can't just keep on sinning. They just can't. If you can, I'm just letting you know, according to Scripture, there is a problem. There is a problem. And this problem can be solved. I think about James 127 because this sums up this passage. I mean, James 127, uh, he puts it like this. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Now that means there is a religion that is impure and defiled. My concern for us today is that there are some people that haven't taken the paternity test and they don't know who their father is. And there's some of us that, that some of us in this room don't know who our dad is. And man, I'm sorry for that. I'm telling you today the great news, you can know who your father in heaven is. You can know who your eternal father is. He says, but this is religion that is pure and undefiled before God. It is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself, what's the next word? Unstained. Unstained. Church, man, can we get a vision again for a, a pure and spotless bride? Can I just contend for a moment? The Bible says Jesus is coming back for a bride, for a church that is pure, Listen, man, I struggle with purity. You struggle with purity. I get that. What I'm telling you, though, is there is something beautiful about a pure and unstained church. This is the religion that God wants. This is the, re- this is the spirituality that God looks at. He says to keep oneself unstained from the world. 
Well, what is the world? We covered it a couple weeks ago. The world is anything that makes righteousness look ridiculous and makes sin look normal. That's the, the other day, um, Ruthie had gone to bed already, and I don't have like, like I can't watch things on my phone or something. And she had some, one of those things you can watch shows on your phone. So I took her phone, and I just flipped it. I'm not even going to tell you what the show was, but I just flipped, up, flipped out a show that I, that's like a famous show or whatever. And I'm like, okay, everyone likes this show. It's got, had a lot of seasons or whatever. So I open the, and I just start watching the show. So I'm just doing some cardio or whatever. I'm going to go do this, but you know, she'd already gone to bed. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I'm watching the show. From the first minute of that show, until the last minute of that show, it was 100% ego, pride of life, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, deception. I, I kept waiting for it to, be, to make it look like, to sort of expose it as, don't be like that. But at the end of the show, the, the main character was the hero, and they were utterly wretched. I was like, oh my gosh, like, like this is, it was making that look normal. And in my heart, I'm like, man. What's going to happen on the next episode? And so I didn't know I didn't, but, <laughs> but there really was that sense of like, good Lord, Lord this, this, this is the world. Like this, the world makes righteousness look abnormal. Like, oh my gosh, how, how, how ridiculous. How, how someone would wait until they're married to have sex. Oh, that would be ridiculous. Someone's going to tell the truth even if it hurts them. Oh, no one does such a thing. Someone would actually care about what, what else, someone else is going through. Oh my goodness. Nobody does. So, you know, the world makes righteousness look ridiculous and it makes sin look normal. And the Bible says we are to resist. It says this is what God wants. Keep yourself unstained from the world. Thursday night we had a Sarah banquet, and so I got all dressed, you know, to go to this this Sarah banquet, and uh, and I had to be on stage to do something, and and so my daughter, two of my daughters had been with Miss Helen. They'd been cooking chocolate, and so they'd been they'd make chocolate cupcakes, and so I was thinking they'd wait until after dinner to eat their cupcakes, but they clearly hadn't waited till after dinner to eat their cupcakes. But I didn't know that they hadn't waited till after dinner to eat their cupcakes because I'm getting ready to go to the banquet. They'd come home from being with her, and they said, "Oh, Daddy, before you leave, can I get a big hug?" I said, "Sure." I'm wearing a white shirt, and so. One my daughters comes up and she gives me a big hug and right here and right here and right here and right here chocolate there was chocolate everywhere <laughs> chocolate stains everywhere I thought to myself oh god bless you Miss Helen god bless you <laughs> <laughs> they love being with Miss Helen and and I'm I, and I, I as soon as I hugged her I'm getting ready to say goodbye I didn't even see my shirt I just saw her face I'm thinking your, your face and hands are full of chocolate and and I'm wearing a white shirt and, and I'm thinking, what? And I don't want, I, I, I'm not going to have my kid ever feel bad for giving me a hug. So I just had to kind of pull it together, walk in the other room. But I knew something in that moment, which was this. The way stains work is if you will deal with a stain quickly, the stain comes out. But if you sit there and you wait for stains, those stains work themselves in a way that later on down the road, it's much, much, much harder to take out. What does it mean when it says keep yourself unstained from the world? I'll tell you part of the application of this is this. There are times in your life when you've allowed stains into your life, into your heart. You've allowed sin into your life, into your heart. You've allowed iniquity into your life, into your heart. You need to deal with it, and you need to deal with it now, and you need to deal with it quickly because the longer the stain settles, the more permanent the stain becomes, and some little tide to go is not going to do the trick. I keep hearing people say things like, well, Mike, I, I ask God to forgive me for my sin. Well, he will forgive you for your sin, but we heard this in, in 1 John 1. Confess your sins to God who's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Sin doesn't just bring death. Sin also brings a stain. And let me, tell, let me, let me just speak to some of you because when I was praying for this week and I felt so clearly there are some of you that you, you love Jesus but there are stains in your soul and I'm giving you a warning right now that those stains are to be dealt with today in the name of Jesus. Jesus and his blood and his grace and his love are powerful and effective and mighty and his grace gives us power to overcome. But man, stop playing. Keep yourself unstained from the world. I'm not hearing Christians talk like this enough. I need people looking at me in the eyes and be like, Mike, keep yourself unstained. Literally, I was at the gym the other day and I'm like, you know, thinking on these verses and, and there's like two females right in front of me and they're just like, just like bending over and I'm, I mean, literally, I'm like, I'm like, I, I literally like closed one eye and turned and someone was like laughing at me. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to stay unstained right now, you know? 
And they're like, that just looks all awkward. You know, it's like, you know, you fl Joseph fled. You know, sometimes you got to leave the gym early. I mean, I'm not joking. I, the other day, I, was, I literally was walking like, I was just walking just like this. And someone's like, oh, how ungodly. Yeah, how, are, you, are you so ungodly that you can't handle? I'm just, I'm just so prone, prone to be stained. Lord, I feel it. Prone to be stained by the world I hate. They make, this is what, see, see, number one, they make a practice. They make a practice. They make a practice of righteousness. And verse 10 says, by this it is evident who are the children of God, who are the children of the devil. Whoever doesn't practice righteousness is not of God. In other words, whoever allows stains to just stay there is not of God. And nor is the one who doesn't love his brother. This is the, this is the paternity test. This week I'm reading about cell phones and they, they say that, you know, cell phones have more bacteria on them than public restroom toilets. You're like putting on your phone, you're, you know, you're putting on your cheek there. It's like, I was just imagining like going to a public toilet, just like putting my cheek on the, on the toilet seat, you know, like, this is what he's saying. He's like, whoever is born of God, they don't keep putting their, they, my wife's like, that's why I clean my phone. I'm like, why did you tell me I don't clean my phone? She's like, each man's accountable for his own unrighteousness. I'm like, baby. I almost wish we would become spiritually germaphobic sometimes. You know, it's like when germaphobes have more concern of bacteria than we do of sin, there is a problem. Number one, the paternity test. They make a practice of righteousness. But it's not just that because it says here. But it's not just that. They, these are the children, nor is the one who doesn't love his brother. Number two, it's not just that they keep themselves unstained from the world. They visit orphans and widows in their affliction. The second part of this, the second side of this coin is they, that the children of God, they are known for love. Verse 11 says, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. What does it mean to have pure and undefiled religion? It's to love one another. We visit people in their times of need. John 13, 35 says it like this. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another another. Now this passage is brilliant because it doesn't let love remain a sappy sentiment. Love becomes something very practical because in verse 12 now it says, we should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised brothers that the world hates you. That, that is going to happen. Like, can, can, we, can we please stop trying to be the cool the cool kids in the world, like, can we give that up? Can we stop trying to, like, remember being in, in middle school and you're like, oh, there's the cool kids, and, and it's, uh, like, all of us, there's nothing like watching a 52-year-old trying to be cool. There's nothing like watching a seventh grader trying to get in the cool crowd, you know, and, and forsaking his real friends to go get in the cool crowd that's going to stab him in the back anyway, right? He's saying, like, stop trying to fit, you're, you don't fit in this world. Their daddy is the devil and your daddy is me. Father, you are our God. Oh, God, you are my God. Who would agree with me on that? Early will I seek you. You know, you, you are my God. I have no good aside from you, David would say. For we know that we have passed from death, out of death to life. How do we know? What's the paternity test? Because we what? Because we love the brothers. Whoever doesn't love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know that he laid down his life for us, as we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone, here, here, now here, here's, the, here's the clincher, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word, or in talk, but in deed and in truth. When we were over in Spain, we were with this group of guys that were very holy. Like, they very much lived holy. And, like, you're like, oh, my goodness. Like, they're very serious and, and very holy. But we were out in this tent. And after one of the meetings, they had, like, a porta potty Everyone know what a porta potty is, you know? They had, like, one of the porta potties And so one of the guys is, like, really godly and traveled the world. And they speak before, you know, half a million people at a time and, and all this kind of thing. And they've been mightily used by God and, all, and I mean, just fiercely used by God. Well, one of the guys went to the porta potty and one of the other guys, he kind of snuck over to the porta potty and while the guy was going, he started shaking the porta potty. 
This was after the meeting. And the guy in Sunday, like, ah, what's going on? You can hear all this. And everyone, people were just cracking up. The meeting was almost all over. It was so fun, though, to watch how here's a guy that was very, very, very holy, and yet he still had a sense of humor. You ever met someone that's like really, really holy, and you're like, you're very holy, but I feel like you would never even get a joke. You ever met someone like that? The picture that John is painting here is imagine the kind of people that are actually holy, that, that are actually righteous, and, and they're not afraid. To, like, it's not, it should not be strange to hear a man say, family, your dad wants to be righteous. I mean, I want to say to my wife, Ruth, I want to be holy. Like, I often don't feel like I am, but I want to live a life that's holy. Do you guys agree with that? Like, because I'll get around Christians like, oh, that just sounds so religious. Yeah, it is. It's pure and undefiled religion. And I realize we're about relationship, not religion, but sometimes I wonder if we have overcorrected on our, all of our business about Jesus is my daddy, Jesus is my homeboy, Jesus is my, Jesus is holy. Can I just say that? The Lord is holy, like sin disturbs him. And by the way, not just the sins that the world agrees. Like even right now, like I'm, a, I'm so glad that we're fighting human trafficking, but can I get clear, right now everyone's against human trafficking. At least in America, if you go out and tell people, man, we're going to fight human trafficking, everyone's like, oh, cool. Some guy could be storting cocaine and be like, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. <laughs> but if you said something like, if you said something like, man, I am, we want to take down adultery in our culture. People are like, oh, ah, ah, ah not so sure is, is what, that, that's what he might say. Mike, what are you saying? I'm saying, listen, I need you to hear what, everything I'm about to say because I want us to be holy on one hand and I want us to be loving on the other. I want us to be so holy because we realize that God has restored us and I want you to catch this phrase, restored people don't just sit on the restoration. Restored people, restore people. Forgiven people don't just sit on their forgiveness. Forgiven people, forgive people. Redeem people don't just sit on the redemption. Redeem people, redeem people. People that have been graced by God, don't just sit on the grace. Graced people, grace people. People that have received kindness, don't just sit on the kindness. People that have received kindness, they show kindness. Those that have received the provision of God, don't just take the blessings of God. Blessed people, bless people. Redeem people, redeem people. Restored people, restore people. I mean, last week, I praise you. I mean, what, what does it mean when he says, if, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide? That means if you see your brother, what does this look like in the real world? It doesn't mean you walk up to someone and say, love you, sis. It means when you see someone in need, you meet that need if you can't. You can't do what you can't do, but you do do what you can do. Last week, Missionary Sam was here. We already heard that there was about 100, and I already know of checks being written for 145,000. There was a Light the Lantern event that happened that had um, quite a few more thousand dollars come in on top of that. I know of another somewhere between 15 and 40,000 dollars that are commitments that are coming in. So we're talking, we're going to approach from last weekend somewhere between all those events taking place up over 200,000 dollars going toward children being rescued from their slavery. That means if you've got this world's goods and you can do something about it, you go do something about it. We've got this weekend going on. Which this, this, we've got, this weekend is like a, a freedom weekend. This is a restoration weekend. Let me tell you about this restoration of civil rights that we've got going on. Some of these slides are up here. Florida is one of only three states in the nation that still has a lifetime ban on voting for felons. One out of every 10 Floridians are shut out of the electoral process. Florida ranks number one in the nation with 1.6 million people stripped of their right to vote. 1.6 million people. So one of the things that we're doing is we're trying, this, this was a surprise to some of us. Some guy has gone to jail. He's done his crime. He's been a felon. And he gets out of jail. He's done his time. I thought once you did your time, you paid the price to society. I thought you got restored. What we didn't, we didn't realize, I didn't realize until recently, was that uh, in some, well, in Florida, um, that's not the case. That doesn't happen automatically. And so what happens is you have to like try to go get these rights to, to get on a, to be able to vote, to be able to run for office, to be able to be a full citizen. You, there's gonna ha something has to happen. One of the things we're even asking you today is, would you help us with this? By the way, this doesn't apply to people that have done murder or people that have done sexual crimes. So if someone's worried about sexual, this does not include that. 
batch, but, but anybody else that's done that. It inclu- so when we've got a place like this, so even here at Greenhouse, we feel like restored people restore people. So when we say, wait, if someone has this world's goods, like right now out there, we've got petitions that are ready that you could, it would literally take you two minutes of your time to b- let people that have gotten back into society where they could be, just like we like to say a lot of times, on earth as it is in heaven, in heaven, when someone's stuff has been paid for, they get restored, which is why we already know how Jesus told us to pray and to work on the earth like it is in heaven. I'm asking you to help us go love people, and t- it will take you two minutes of your time in a tangible way to get people restored because we are known for love. By the way, if you're wondering what a big deal this is, some of you, this might, you might not understand what a big deal this is. I was talking to Dr. Perkins a couple weeks ago, John Perkins. You know, John Perkins, of course, was beaten almost to death in jail. He was in jail for marching to try to get people's rights to vote. So this is a pretty sensitive issue for quite a few people where it's like, wait a minute, there, there's, there's a track record, there's a stain. Might I even say there's a stain on the church where the church has not stood on the right side of some things like this one, where there's people like John Perkins that almost died trying to get people to vote. I'm asking you now, if you've got a pen, if you know how to write a signature, go help us with this petition to get people's rights restored because restored people restore people. Fatherlessness is the number one predictor of uh, homelessness, poverty, crime, suicide, abortion, jail, which is why it says in James 1, It says that pure and undefiled religion is to visit orphans and widows in their time of need. We visit people in their time of need. We we go and and, and we visit them. I think about ways that we're trying to visit the fatherless. Do you know that the jails are full of fatherless people? We've got the brand program going on right now with kids in town that are at risk. And, and I'm not going to emphasize all these, but I'll just, let, I'll just remind you that, that any of you that will help out with the brand program, helping kids that are at risk to gang activity, most of those are fatherless. The Bible says true religion is you visit them in their affliction. We've got people that are helping with our wave. You know, Pastor Michael, Pastor Mike and Pastor Michael doing wave and sweat. Um, our, our youth groups, our, our middle school and high school youth group, there's so many fatherless kids that are in there. And yet we've got opportunities. I want to thank all of you that help out with our youth ministries and even with our kids' ministries that every single week are giving yourselves to help. The, these are the fatherless. There's, there's something about when, when I'm, I'll hear the reports and I saw one of the youth leaders coming back and he'd just been out visiting one of the schools where some fatherless kids, seeing them at lunchtime and loving on these kids. I'm like, that is the real deal sweat leaders wave leaders god bless you thank you for pouring your heart out for for you know teenage boys i mean i got a teenage boy i gotta tell you man i got teenage boys thank you for doing that thank you for those that these these kids that don't have dads when they don't have dads they got a church because they've got a father in heaven and we are known because we make a practice of righteousness and we are known for our love. We got people going out, we got mentoring, we've got tutoring going on after school for these kids. I just want to just lay it out before you. Every Monday night, we've got groups that go out on Monday nights that go into the, into the prisons, into the jails. Most of those guys in those jails, these are fatherless individuals that are in the jails. God bless you guys that are going out there. Madi, I think you were out there like, was a couple weeks ago or something like that. I'm like, man, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in people's lives. Murray's been going into the juvenile detention center. These are people that oftentimes are fatherless and our message is you don't have to stay fatherless because you have a father in heaven. Restored people, restore people, man. Redeem people, redeem people. I, I was, uh, you know, was reading a story this, this week, you know, created. We've got some of the ladies uh, and gentlemen in our church that will go back and they, and they go out into the streets to get women that are vulnerable to prostitution. And um, here's, Here's one of the, the, the stories that was sent to me, a letter that was kind of sent. Someone said, as I sit here and reflect back on my broken past, this was written by a lady. She said, there is one moment in time that I remember that changed my life forever. I was strung out on crack cocaine. I was homeless, a prostitute, eight months pregnant, lying in a hospital bed after having been beaten into labor. That was the lowest point of my life. I just wanted to die. I had burned all my bridges with my family. They'd all written me off. There was no one I could look to for help, no one I could call. Then one day I was laying recovering in a hospital bed after the trauma of having my labor reversed. My nurse asked me if I would mind if a friend of hers from this organization called Created would come and pray with me. That is the day I will never forget. That is the day I met Created. I remember the look in their eyes. It wasn't judgment. It wasn't disgust. It wasn't blame. It was love. And for the first time in a long time, I knew that that moment someone cared. Someone cared whether I lived or died. Someone cared enough to let me know that I mattered. 
That day has been over six months ago, and they're still a part of my life. I'm currently in a rehabilitation program. I'm due to graduate in a month. What amazes me the most is that Create is still part of my life. Not only have they been there for me spiritually, they've become my sisters. The women have helped me give back my self-worth because they loved me. And today, as a result of their love, support, spiritual guidance, I'm clean and sober. I have a job. I have a four-month-old baby girl who's beautiful. I'm transitioning into my own apartment. If it wasn't for these ladies, I would have had the self-esteem to finish the program. I'm so thankful for them walking into my life that day in the hospital. Thank you for helping me change my life forever. Restored people, restore people. That's what we do because that's who our Father is. Redeem people, redeem people. That's what we do because that's who our Father is. See, see, children of God, they look like their Father. They look like their Father. This weekend when I was at the Sear Banquet, um, Gianna was the speaker there, and Gianna was a, she was, she was a fatherless, unwanted pregnancy that was aborted. She, she was an abortion that, that went wrong, and, and the abortion went wrong, and she was born with the acid eating her body away, but the best news that happened for her, she was born at 6 a.m., so the doctor didn't show up. If the doctor had been there, the, as the law goes, the doctor would strangle the baby to death and, and end the life in some other way. But, but here she is. There was a nurse that had compassion, and literally, literally there's been laws that have made this kind of thing illegal. The nurse calls the ambulance, and they rush this two-pound, way premature abortion, aborted baby to the hospital, and Gianna lives. And if you heard her speak, you would understand. If you ever heard a strong will, it was this woman. She had a strong will. And, she, and she, you know, 18 months later, she gets into some foster home and ends up, you know, no father, never has a father, but gets ended up getting adopted by somebody. And she, has, she still has cerebral palsy. I mean, she, she literally has to limp everywhere as a result of, of the abortion that went bad. But when she talks and she just speaks on behalf of, of unborn children and saying, man, we, we have to stand with those who have no voice for themselves and we've got to be there for people and, and we stand up for them. And, 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 you know, she's like, you know, some of you, if you can just walk across the room, you know, you don't need to give a second thought. For me, I have to call out to Jesus to walk from my chair to a desk. I need them every hour I need thee. You know, she says, these children, they need us. Do you understand that the paternity test of the kingdom of God is that when we see people in need, if you have this world's goods and you see someone in need of this world's goods, we meet those needs. From the womb to the tomb, we meet those needs. When people are in need, the children of God are known for being different because we get up and we meet needs. I was reading this week, um, one of the best books I've read in the last few years is Just Mercy. And um, Brian Stevenson, just an amazing attorney. Any, I mean, I strongly recommend this book, anyone that's looking for a good book to read. But um, there, was a, there was a kid. I mean, one of the tragedies is that sometimes there are actually minors that get tried, convicted, even um, up to execution because of, uh, because of their crimes. So it's interesting. You know, they can't vote. They can't get a gun. But they could actually go to, the, you know, have the death penalty. Have Anyway, there was a kid that... Um, named Charlie, and this kid Charlie uh, just r- raising a horrible, dad wasn't there, his mom let some other guy come live in the house with them, and this guy was abusive, he was always drunk, and he did this stuff, one day he comes home and, and just smashes his mother's face in, and, and I'm not trying to be graphic, but his mom just goes down the ground, and, and she's just bleeding out, and, and Charlie's trying to stop this, the guy goes and crashes drunk, and Charlie, I mean, he's less than 100 pounds, 16 year old boy, less than 100 pounds, barely nourished the way he needs to be and everything, and, uh, just goes in that room, sees this man just sitting there s- snoring at this point in there and and his mother right there and he knew that the man had a gun takes out a gun and finally just goes and shoots the guy by the time he gets arrested has to go call 911 to help his mom and all this stuff they end up taking him they're going to try him as an adult so so brian shows up to go you know he's like okay he's got a caseload of stuff and you know he's an attorney can you go help this guy and go help this kid and it's like well he did something wrong they've got him in this adult jail and all the you know exposed adults and all this kind of thing and and so here's this kid you know less than 100 pound kid that's in the jail and and he goes and he goes and sit down with him and say hey someone begged me to come and help you and he barely has time for this and and charlie won't even talk back you know charlie won't even respond and he's like hey man he just forever he charlie just won't even say a word he gets in there and he's just got like a stone cold face and Brian's trying to talk to him, tries to make jokes, tries to do whatever, nothing works. And, and finally, he kind of gets close. And at one point, the boy just, just breaks down and, and just starts sobbing like you've never heard someone sob. And just starts describing the terrible things that, that the grown men did when they came in the room to him. And the ways that he was violated and the things that were done. And then the next night when it happened again, and, and Brian just sees this. And he's like, man, what? What's going on in this world where little children, I mean, this is his story. The, the, even the, the, the facts of the case were not even disputed. And here's a kid that's, 
that's up for capital crime under those circumstances, exposed to those things. And, and the question is, when you know of these things, do, do, you, do, you just let those, do you just let those realities happen? I mean, this, this book is about that we go do mercy, that the children of God are to be those that do justice, and, and we love mercy, that restored people restore people, that, that we go in there and to, and to hear these stories. If I were to tell you guys the, the stories of the people that are, that are even incarcerated right now, when you, when you hear the stories, you're like, man, God, what, what, what happened in a life like this? Vast major- By the way, the number one indicator of, of people that end up in the prisons is poverty. The Bible tells us, remember the poor. If you, this is the catch, if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart to him, how does God's love abide in him? This is where I get tempted and I've sort of gotten raised in a church culture I think sometimes where we say we are saved by grace but then we treat people with karma. So we had missionary Sam here last week, and we wonder, how do people in the East allow little children to get trafficked? And the answer is, because they believe in karma. They believe in reincarnated states that these kids are getting what they deserve, so you don't mess with it. So when you hear about things that are going on to a kid in prison, for example, or in a jail, and we're like, well, uh, what's going on there? Well, the kid's getting what he deserves. It's so interesting how we love the fact that in heaven God gives us grace, but on earth we're very uppity about giving people karma. And listen, I'm not against, like even today when we've got like the restoration of civil rights, we're talking about people that have done their time. We're not talking about getting people out of jail early. We're talking about people that have already done their time and paid their price to society. They've done all that. We're saying, can they get restored? Because that's how things go in heaven. See, church, the, the children of God are known for two things. On one hand, we are those who make a practice of righteousness. But on the other, we don't just get restored. We end up restoring other people. We are known for our love. We visit orphans and widows in their times of affliction. Church, I'm calling us to be known for this. I'm calling us to be known for the. Could you imagine what would happen if we took this seriously? Could you imagine what would happen, church, if we became the enemies of sin and the friends of sinners? I'm serious about this. When your friend is about to go cheat on his wife, you get in his face. Teenagers, when one of your friends is about to go get addicted to porn, you get in his face. When someone's about to go do something shoddy in their, in their business dealings, you get in their face and we hold each other accountable. We say, no, man, holiness, righteousness, we do what is right, even when it hurts our own cause. If you're doing stuff with someone that you're not married to right now and you know what's wrong, you get that stain off your record today. You get that stain out of your heart today. But we don't just stop at making a practice of righteousness. We, we become known for love. Mike, what do you want me to do today? I want you, number one, if you've got stains in your life today, deal with your stains. Some of you have been forgiven, but you haven't yet revealed those stains. You haven't let God come and bring the bleach of his blood to your stains and wipe them clean. I'm telling you today, you can be clean. But the second part of this is that the paternity test of God says, God's children, we lay down our life for our brothers. When people are in need, we do something about it. I want us to be the kindest, most affectionate, yet holy and righteous, yet welcoming and open-handed, and yet godly and going after him. I want us to be like a, like, like a splinter in people's brains. Like, I don't get you. You're like, you're so holy. When I get around you guys, I'm like, man, I want to live right. I get the feeling when people got around Jesus, they're like, man, you, you want to be right around this guy and yet he was the friend of sinners sinners would hang out with him and sinners would eat with him and sinners would drink with him and yet he'd say to them go and sin no more and yet it wasn't a condemnation it was like life Mike what do you want me to do today uh, like physically I'll, I'll be honest I would like every single person all the term every single person in here I would like you to stop by and sign one of these petitions and help people get their rights restored because that's an actual tangible thing we can do This is an area where the church has a stain that we want to be a part of saying, you know what, just like we want stains off of our personal records, we want stains off the church. When people say, because this is the record the church has right now, oh, the church doesn't touch all that kind of stuff because, because what? Because, well, let's stick to the Bible. Okay, let's stick to the Bible. It says if you've got this world's goods and you see someone in it, you go do something about it. When you leave today, I pray you take some of those with you perhaps, but this is where it ends. Some of us just don't know Some of us, unfortunately, don't even know who our earthly father is. And I'm sorry for that, but I end it just letting you know you can know who your heavenly father is. And his name is Jesus. I'm going to close with this scripture, Psalm 89, verse 
19, 14 rather, Psalm 89 verse 14. Just, you don't need to turn there, just look at these scriptures. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. See, don't miss this. Auditorium A, Auditorium B, Kanapaha, don't miss this. When Jesus takes the throne of your life, you can't help but care about righteousness and justice. You can't help but care about people. You can't help but say, wait, I've been restored, so I restore. I've been forgiven, so I forgive. I've been redeemed, so I redeem. I've been provided for, so I provide for. Like, that's what he's done to me. He says, righteousness, that pure and undefiled religion is this. I long for the day when we are known for the people through whom God visited his people. I think of this closing story, and this is where I end it. There was a dead, there was a dead son in a casket with a grieving mother, and Jesus comes alongside them. And the scripture says that Jesus sees the casket, and he touches the casket. And when he does, this this only son of this mother rises from the dead. And the people said, what could this mean? And, and then they said this. They said this great line. They said, God has visited his people. God has visited his people. When we leave this place, you know what my dream is? My dream is that at your job and at your school and in your home and everywhere you go and in your neighborhood, this week people would say, by the works that we do, by the presence that we bring, God has visited this world through us. I dream of that. But that can only happen if you've been cleaned. So when you leave, if you're clean, I want you to go do some restoration. Let's go restore some people. If you're not clean, though, this is your chance. I want you to take it over in Auditorium A right now. Danley, if you'll take it. Pastor Matt, if you'll take it here in Auditorium B, I want you to come and call people to have their stains removed and then to leave this place and to go love people well. If you've never responded to the grace of God and you're over at Hall right now, Pastors, I want you to come and call people to respond to that grace. Let stains be removed because this is the day that we announce what Jesus has done on the cross is enough. He has destroyed the works of the devil.